So, integration really, I've been asked to talk about SUDS in highways, but the, the, key, the key thing that makes SUDS work in any site, whether it's on highways um, or in a private site, is integration. And there's always this discussion about hard or soft SUDS, um, and it shouldn't be like that. It's the most appropriate solution for the site, given the constraints of that site. Now, again, I've been standing up in front of people for eight years now, saying that you can use SUDS on any site, and I do truly believe that. But you can't get it without thinking about the solution. Um, and uh, you know, earlier, um, there was a mention about opening your minds. You need to work, particularly engineers, you've got to work with other professions, particularly landscape architects, to get the best solutions. And from my point of view, I, I love working with, with urban designers and landscape architects because you do get better solutions. They look better, um, they're valued by the people who live there, and if you get that, then people will look after them. If they look ugly, if you've got an engineer, engineer's straight line, let's draw a line on a, on a map and make a big hole in the ground and put a little bit of grass in it, people won't value it, um, and suds will get a bad name. So sometimes landscape features are best, um, and sometimes hard engineered solutions are best. It depends entirely on the constraints of the site. But often, and I would say in the majority of cases, um, a combination of those two is the right solution. Um, and try and put either in the wrong place and it won't work. So you've got to think about this, which again, from an engineering point of view, for me, that is exciting. Because I don't like what I call engineering by rule book. And I want to use all that engineering education that I've had in the past, use those principles that we've been taught and apply them in different ways to come up with interesting solutions. So what can we, what can we use in, in highways? Well, probably these are the most common ones, uh, but what you shouldn't do is be constrained by a list. Uh, again, you just need to think about what's happening. And, and, and manufacturers, suppliers in particular, will be coming up with, with new and possibly better solutions all the time. And I'm sure David from Hydra is going to talk about some of those later on. Um, so you do, again, it comes back to being open-minded um, and just looking at it on, in its own right and see whether it provides something that, that manages the water, manages pollution in an effective manner, um, is cost-effective, um, and is cost-effective to maintain. So the, the main things that I'm going to talk about today are permeable pavements, bioretention systems, which have already been mentioned, uh, things that we call treatment channels and tree irrigation that we've incorporated into, into some schemes, um, and then all the other ones that you, you, you're familiar with, and then something about retrofitting as well. Um, hopefully we'll dispel a few myths along the way. So I've nicked this out of one of uh, Paul's, uh, Paul's documents, so plagiarism is alive and well today. Um, but that is essentially, I think, how a lot of people design SUDS. And I use SUDS in its very loosest sense there um, today. You take all the runner, run off, you shove it in some gullies, um, get it away from the site as quickly as possible. Oh yeah, we need to put suds in. Yeah, we'll whack a pond. Where can we fit a pond? Um, and you, you, probably, you may well hear a lot of rubbish about suds is expensive, uh, particularly from the Home Builders Federation. Absolute nonsense. We design suds schemes and, and we do a lot of work with design and build contractors. And the only reason they employ us is because we save them money and we save them or we get them, we win them tenders by putting in alternative designs using suds. Um, so they are, if they're designed correctly, they will be lower cost um, than conventional systems. If you design them like that, putting a conventional system with a pond at the end of it or a big plastic box at the end of it, they won't be cost effective necessarily. So, in my opinion, um, and we'll have a discussion about this no doubt at the end, that is not suds. And if you design like that, you get something like this. So another question for you, who thinks that's attractive? Now I'm an engineer, I like concrete, but there is a limit to it. Um, and it's got steep sides, the steep sides continue right down into the water. Um, you've got those concrete head walls that they've, they've tried to sort of mitigate the risk there by putting a bit of a wooden fence around it. But to, in my view, that is a complete disaster from a health and safety point of view. Um, it doesn't look good. Um, it's not suds. And again, it, it's probably expensive. So end of pipe ponds and wetlands, they're not suds. They're a maintenance liability. 
Um, and you don't get biodiversity by just shoving a green bit at the end of a system. You need to work with ecologists uh, to design uh, ponds and wetlands and any of the sustainable drainage, the, the green systems, you need to work with ecologists to maximise the biodiversity. And if you do put ponds and wetlands within a system, to maximise the biodiversity, you do need source control because you need clean water feeding into those systems for the, to, to get the, the, uh, the biodiversity. And also for the, for the community to value those systems, you need to keep the dirt out of any water open, open water features. Uh, because as soon as you get oil slicks across them, things like that, then the next thing that goes in there is a shopping trolley, as in this case. So, local authority people, anybody fancy adopting that? Easy to maintain, effective as a drainage system. There's a guy from Workingham here, that's in Workingham. Um, it also happens, I don't think I've put, no, I've not put the right picture in there, um, but there are issues with conventional drainage systems that we just tend to accept without really thinking about them. Um, and we do find that people put a lot of barriers in the way of using suds. Um, if, if, if somebody came up with that system now, um, I suspect that we may well be asking some serious questions about whether it's appropriate. Oh, interestingly, that, that um, picture on the right-hand side, when I took that photograph, at the same time, there are lots of it, um, developments there in that area of Workingham that have got concrete block permeable pavement in the car parks. And I've got several photographs of, of those areas that are bone dry. Um, no issues. The, the, the block paving, one of them in particular, is not being maintained, as far as I'm aware, for 10 years. And it's still working effectively as a drainage system. So this. Um, this is another uh, permeable pavement site in, um, in Stamford. And it's essentially um, concrete block permeable paving that leads into some, some canals. So we treated the water, um, or I've not designed this, Bob Bray, um, a well-known landscape architect, has designed this system. Um, but it treats the water and then allows him to bring that water out at a shallow depth into the urban landscape and, and maximise the value of it because people do like having water in the landscape, but it's got to look nice. Again, um, I have a habit of driving around the country with a camera, and every time it starts raining heavily, um, I jump out and start taking pictures. I now get told off by my children because they're getting fed up of uh, visiting drainage systems on holiday. But um, one of the previous slides um, was talking about the, the recent rainfall, and I think it had 40 to 50 mil rainfall we've had up in places like Hebden Bridge, really. Um, this is four, uh, three or four years ago, um, a similar scenario, very heavy, um, a, a big volume of rainfall over the, the previous night and early that morning, and yet when I turned up at that car park, it's, it's dry. That permeable pavement is working extremely effectively. And again, I could have taken similar pictures around Stanford, um, where it was a wash, uh, where you've got normal drainage systems. And it's four years old at that time, it's never been cleaned, never had a sweeper on it, um, apart from one occasion. Um, so, so they are robust and they work effectively. The one occasion it had a sweeper on it was at the end of construction, because the developer spent a fortune on that expensive block paving and rapidly covered it in about 25 millimetres of, of dried, caked on mud, um, so that it wouldn't work. But it was rehabilitated. The mud was, it was scraped off, um, and then it was swept. We did have to, uh, Bob gave it some oomph with a sweeper and took all the grit out of it, so it was re-gritted. Uh, but it was, that was effective in rehabilitating. So if these things clog up effect completely, uh, which is gonna be rare, um, then you can do something about it. And I can see Gordon, um, you'll be talking about that, maybe. So they're an ideal such solution on many sites, particularly where you haven't got any space because they don't take up any extra space. You're building a road, um, you're building a car parking space, so you're just changing the nature of that construction. And you're changing the specification of the materials so that they behave when they've got water in them. And there was a comment this morning, oh, you're talking about permeable pavements, wet subbase. No, I'm talking about permeable pavements, generally dry subbase. Because as part of the drainage design, the, dra the, the subbase is designed to, to actually empty and drain away relatively quickly. And if you took that sub-base design to America 
and put that underneath a road in America in accordance with the, uh, a not the ASTM, the AASHTO design guide, that would be a very well-drained pavement and you would be able to, it would um, increase the structural capacity of the pavement. So again, there are things we need to look at and perceptions we need to look at um, when we're designing these things. Permeable pavements are a source control technique which is an important part of sustainable drainage and they can attenuate large rainfall events. There's usually a lot of capacity in the sub-base and the reason for that is because the design of the sub-base is usually governed by the traffic loading. So you end up with a much thicker sub-base than you need to deal with water. So therefore you can bring roofs into, into it, for example, or adjacent impermeable areas. They uh, reduce the volume of runoff because a lot of the water just soaks into the blocks and into the aggregate and never appears at an outfall. Um, and, they can, and they prevent rainfall runoff um, up to 5 mil, up to events up to 5 mil, which is one of the requirements um, of the SUS manual and also the new national standards. So they are very effective. Um, and they're extremely good at, at pollution removal. That's been demonstrated time and time again by work that's been done at Coventry University, um, up at Edinburgh, and worldwide as well. And they're robust. But they're not appropriate on all parts of the site. Um, and they're not the solution to all flooding problems. Um, and they need to be designed and constructed correctly. Which is just like any other road construction. Uh, it's not a reason for not using them, but you do have to be careful uh, when you're designing these things, um, and particularly with, with construction. And I'll talk about that in a, in a few slides time. What we need to do is apply our, our engineering skills um, the picture there is a, a, a grass pave system. That's actually in Holland where they know how to build these things a little bit better than we do in this country. Um, again, uh, if, if you just put the grass pave down, shove the cheapest topsoil you can into those voids, generally compact it down and throw a bit of grass seed on, um, it's not going to look good. Uh, you need to put free draining sandy topsoil in there. It needs to be lower than the level of the, of the concrete so that the car wheels don't compact it and you need to put appropriate grass seed in there that can survive in the conditions that it will be subject to. Interesting one this. Um, a lot of problems I see in drainage systems um, are because there's a basic concept that some people don't seem to understand. Um, and again, Particularly with permeable pavements, it is very important to understand that. So the one on the, the left-hand side is a, is a system that's been installed recently in Reading. Um, I suspect that there will be complaints about that very shortly. You can see how steeply it, it, it is on the, the left-hand side, at uh, the right-hand side of that, in those parking bays, and on the right-hand side. And that hill is actually quite steep as well. So water in that. If they've not put any controls in there, and I don't know what the design is, so, so maybe I'm doing them a disservice. Uh, but if there aren't any controls within the sub-base, all the water will flow down to the bottom of that system and it will end up looking like the one on the right, which regularly has water ponding on it like that. And it's simply because the water in the sub-base flows to the lowest end and they've overestimated the storage within the sub-base. Are they durable? Um, well, this is a, an 11-year-old permeable pavement on a landfill site. So the landfill is, is um, still settling, um, it's still degrading, there's movement, um, and that permeable pavement, when I took that photograph a couple of years ago, was still working effectively. There's bits of moss growing in some of the joints, but by and large, when it rains, the water just trickles away and finds a point where there isn't any moss, which is only a few blocks away, um, and, it, and it works okay. And, and more importantly, it's still structurally sound. Uh, other issues, uh, particularly with the, the, the sites um, such as, as Upton, um, one of the issues that, that, that we have, and particularly Bob Bray has with Upton, is the depth of those swales. Um, they could have actually been more multifunctional, where people, where kids maybe could have played in them if there were shallow water depths in there. Um, and I know that the reason, one of the reasons why, why they are so deep is because you've got normal gullies feeding into those systems, which immediately takes the water deep. If they'd have put permeable pavements in and, and source control, they could have been a lot shallower um, and the water wouldn't run down them quite as quickly as it does in big rainfall events. But to do that, you've got to put permeable pavement within five metres of buildings. And sometimes you might want to infiltrate, but just let the water soak in like a circleway. 
um, and some people aren't comfortable with that. But we have demonstrated on, I would say, hundreds of sites now that it is safe to allow water to soak in near buildings on some sites. Now, you can't do that just willy-nilly. You do have to employ a geotechnical engineer. Um, but it's not because I am a geotechnical engineer. There are, there are sites, um, and Ian Payne from Kent lives in one of the worst areas probably of the country in this respect. There are areas where the ground conditions, you wouldn't even dream of doing that. Um, so you do need geotechnical advice on every site that you do it. But if you think about it um, and look at the issues, look at the ground conditions and the foundation construction, then on many sites you are able to do it. And for example, you know, if, that, if, that, if those houses were sat on piled foundations, uh, soaking a little bit of water in at the surface of the ground is not going to make a, any difference at all to the performance of those foundations. There's lots of guidance on permeable pavements. Um, Interpave, if you go to Interpave's website, there, there's a design guide on there. Uh, there's lots of um, work on, on some of the frequently asked questions, does water freeze um, in permeable pavements, those sorts of issues. Um, I've built a permeable pavement, I've put it in my freezer, got told off by my wife, and I can say that freezing water in permeable pavements is not a problem. Um, and if anybody wants, wants any information about that, then, then talk to me afterwards. There's a British standard, uh, BS 7533 part 13 for concrete block permeable paving. And recently the Highways Agency, uh, well so recently, it must be two years ago now um, at least, the Highways Agency undertook a, a, a big trial at Holland Ward, um, at, at Charcon's factory at Holland Ward in Derbyshire, <coughs> looking at the performance of different types of permeable pavement, so concrete block permeable paving and porous asphalt. Uh, and there's a lot of really good information in that TRL document. So permeable pavements are good, but we do not want a world where the only suds we ever see is permeable pavement. It would be fairly boring, I have to say. Um, there are issues, um, particularly where HGVs, where you've got regular HGVs turning, um, they're not so good uh, because they do tend to, tend to spread. So on the bottom right-hand side, um, that was actually a car park um, to a, a, a five-a-side football centre. But what happened was that the, um, they had very frequent deliveries with a half-ton truck uh, for about two years, and it was the same driver. And he came into the car park and did his three-point turn in this seven-and-a-half-ton truck in exactly the same place um, every couple of days. Um, and you can see there that the blocks have started to spread. So if you've got HGVs doing a three-point turn once in a while, it's not an issue. Um, but where you have got it more frequently, then you, ha you have to think whether it's the most appropriate solution. And there are other solutions that are equally as good. So bioretention. Um, you'll see lots of pictures of bioretention systems, but more, normally uh, they'll either be from Australia or from America. Now we've got our, our own homegrown one. Um, this is in Ashford in Kent. Um, they they remodelled... The, uh, the, the inner ring road around the centre of, of Ashford Town Centre, and as part of it, they've, they've installed this, this bioretention area. It's been there three or four years, and I took these pictures earlier this year, um, and it, it, it looks remarkably good. Now, I'm not a landscape architect, so the planting is probably one of those Marmite issues, um, but from a drainage point of view, it looks like it's working really well. Um, it's managing the silt how it should be. There is a little bit of silt build up just where those, um, those um, drop curbs are that allow the water into it. Uh, but that could easily be managed with a shovel at the moment. So in terms of maintenance, it's not a major issue. Um, and then at the bottom of it, it sort of steps down that, that shallow slope that the road comes down. Um, and at the bottom of it, there's an overflow into a gully. Um, and there are, some un there are some pipes underneath that system. That, um, that collect the water up and off it goes. So essentially it's there uh, to provide attenuation um, and treatment. And I can see Ian's looking very interested at, at that. We're working with, um, with Owen Davis, who you're going to speak, um, hear speak later, so I'm not going to steal his thunder on this one. Um, but we're working with him to fit bioretention areas into, into a couple of streets in, in Lambeth. Uh, now, so far, people have to always told me that 
retrofitting suds into streets is difficult, that there are all these constraints. Now, there are constraints in these streets, and in particular, there are lots of services. But my view is, you look at the constraints, you look, and you look where the services are, and you design, you, you fit these things in where you can. Um, and we've got a, a contingency plan within the design in case we come across unexpected services. And that's how we're going to deal with it. That's how you would deal with it with any other construction um, project. And that's how we'll do it this, this way. So essentially, we're just going to build out from the curbs um, and allow the water to come into the bioretention systems. And we, we're, we're putting them where there are existing gullies. So it's essentially, the overflow will be the existing gully. Uh, we, and that is one of the things that will make these particularly cost effective. And we, Owen will talk more about the, the community engagement work that's going to go on um, when, we, when we put these in. And that's a cross section. All it is is just a shallow depression with a free draining material underneath it. Um, now, in terms of um, performance, water management performance, we can actually just use the surface depression to give us a little bit of attenuation. We can put an open graded granular material there to give us more storage underneath it. Or we can put some thin plastic boxes under there to give us even more storage. And it's just, a, you know, we're, we're working with um, URS at the moment to work out how much storage we need to actually have an impact on the areas um, that are affected by flooding from that system. Swales and basins, um, there's one up on this uh, near Stansted Airport on the A120 that's been in quite a few years now. Um, that's a highways agency road and they've got their own guidance on how to design swales. Um, one on the, the left is, is up on the M8 in Scotland, a uh, bit deeper. Probably the one at Stansted is, is just taking water over the edge, so you've not got a deep swale. The one at the bottom, uh, the one on the left is probably taking water from gullies, so you end up with a deeper system. Now there are issues with land take, side slopes, etc. So again, if you can get water into a swale from a shallow, either from the surface via permeable pavement or any other surface system, that will be better in terms of fitting the swales into the site. And the one on the left, uh, the one on the bottom right, sorry, um, is a factory in Northumberland. Um, big concrete, hard standing, and all it has on it is, is so, uh, piles of sawdust and piles of logs. Very, very heavy sediment load. Uh, and the swale actually is the only effective, easy to maintain system that you can use on that site. Um, but again, um, it's on the site boundary. Land take was an issue, and so we've put the gabion, the gabion wall there is, is encroaching into a, into a big landscaping mound that was designed to hide the factory. Uh, but we've taken the gabion wall and we allow the water to flow into it to give us extra storage within the swale. So these are all the kind of things that you have to think about um, to, to effectively design these, these systems. And sometimes, they, you know, squeeze green features in to, to a site or alongside a highway. Um, tree irrigation, we've, in, we've incorporated tree irrigation into this site in Blackpool, so we're using treatment channels, shallow, distributed plastic boxes, not just one big tank at the end of the system. The water flows straight into the tank, so we're doing the attenuation exactly where, very close to where it hits the ground, so it's source control, but we're losing water where we can to the trees. We've got a little bit of infiltration on that site, we've got a leaky tank, we lose a little bit to the trees. Um, a little bit goes to the sewer. So sometimes it's not just one outfall that you're looking at. Sometimes to make these things work, you've got to look at different ways of losing the water. Um, so you've got the channel on the right hand side of that picture, collects the water, put it, puts it into the plastic boxes, um, which are those circular, those rectangles with the circular or oval um, <coughs> shapes in them. And then the two blue areas, um, further to the centre of the picture, essentially that's a magic foam. It's like the foam that you put in hanging, uh, hanging baskets, but it allows the water, it soaks up water from the drainage system, but it only releases it to the trees on demand, so the tree roots don't come saturated. And that's just a picture of it being installed. But it's all very shallow and, and, and it's all, it, it's source control at heart. Um, treatment channels we use quite a lot. Now these are proprietary system, they are one proprietary system out of many, and as I said, Davey's going to talk about different ones, and there are lots of other manufacturers. 
Don't discount those systems out of hand just because they're not on the SUS manual. Look at each one on its own merits um, and see whether it ticks all the boxes. So this one, um, although it's a channel, it's not a conventional channel. It only collects the water from the surface and then it stops it dead and it treats it. It's a mini oil separator in effect. Um, and you can see there that one being constructed, it can't actually carry water along it. But we've been putting these in with this, this particular manufacturer now for 10 years um, and we've demonstrated recently um, that it, it works in terms of pollution removal, it works better than permeable pavements. Um, if it does clog, it's easy to clean. It doesn't pass the, the water, uh, it doesn't pass the silt forward into the plastic boxes. Um, and if, if the silt gets into those little outlets, um, it's, it's easy to remove it and we can rehabilitate it back to its as new condition. And on the right hand side, um, the ultimate sustainable drainage system. This was put in underneath a temporary car park. And although it was temporary, it did have a surfacing, a hard surfacing. So um, after about five or six years, this shopping centre wanted to build an extension. And they knew they wanted to do that when they built the car park. So it was always the intention that that drainage system, channels and plastic boxes, will be taken out and reused. And when those boxes were taken out, there wasn't any sign of silt in there at all. Um, we just lifted them out, didn't, didn't need to wash them or anything, and put them into the, into the new area. So, coming back to the most appropriate solution, it will depend on the site constraints. Um, this is a site up in Scotland where we were told by SEPA we needed to use filter drains. We had to, we had to take the water to the far side of the car park um, and, and drain it off the edge of that car park into a filter drain or a swale. Now, as you can see, we're not going to do that, have all the water flowing towards the front of the car park because that's where the hotel is. And one of the design constraints on that site is that the people who are going to run that hotel don't want to swale in the front of the building. Um, it's stepped. The, the, the higher part of that car park to the right-hand side is actually phase two of the development. So what we're going to do with phase one until we get phase two in. So in that situation, that kind of solution isn't the answer. Now maybe permeable pavement is a solution or the treatment channels, but you, you need to be very, very careful um, about looking at, at, at sort of some of the guidance in the SUDS manual in particular um, and applying it without thinking about it. The SUDS manual is extremely good and, and, and all of the guidance is good, but think about it before you use it. And then finally, just a few things, particularly for the local authorities here and particularly for DEFRA um, in the new national guidance, um, supervision is critical. If we don't have strong supervision of these systems, local authorities are going to be adopting um, nightmares, to be honest. Um, and the, the statements that I've seen, supervision fee could be a further cost. Yeah, well, yeah, if you build things right in the first place, maybe the cost won't be so high. And I think there is a carrot and a stick um, approach you can have to this. Um, but the poor contractors need to be penalised and, and you need to supervise those very, very closely to ensure that you're not um, adopting a liability. Um, and you, so this is a quote from a guy in Portland, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And that picture is a, perm a permeable, in inverted commas, pavement um, that was installed in some brand new council offices in South Wales. And when I went down there to do some training, I stood up, permeable pavements are brilliant, blah, blah, blah. And all the delegates put their hands up and said, we've got permeable pavement in our car park outside. It's brand new. Every time it rains, it floods. There's standing water on the surface. It's like the worst thing you want to hear as a trainer. Uh, but at lunchtime, I went out there to have a look at it. Um, and you can probably see there's one block in the center of that photograph that's got two little notches out of it at either end. That is one permeable block. They had surfaced it with normal blocks and put sand in it and put one permeable block in there. It's a Friday afternoon job. Uh, it, it's flat and there's no gully outlets or anything like that. It, it was designed as a permeable pavement, but it's not been designed properly. And supervision would have picked that up. Uh, and even normal drainage systems. This is a normal drainage system. I've been paid a fortune to sort out the problems on this site. Um, essentially, um, I think you can see there, 
um, the notes at the bottom. This is an as-built as survey after a lot of problems became apparent with this drainage system. Um, design, 1 times 240 mil orifice. Constructed, or as-built, 2 times 240 mil orifices. Every single manhole in that site had, a, had an orifice flow control, and the contractor had taken it upon himself to put two in instead of one. And we never ever got to the bottom of who made that decision and why they made that decision. So finally, um, if you want safe and easy to maintain suds, so you do need source control, um, you do need a management train, which I'm sure other people will talk about today, um, and you want to avoid this, you want to avoid deep canyons um, and deep water within those systems. Um, and a final thought, um, those who say suds cannot be done, um, please don't interrupt those of us that are doing it, because we're doing this on a daily basis. My day job is designing systems. Um, and I, as I said, by, by using the most appropriate combination of solutions and careful design, um, you can provide an affordable solution um, on any site. Thank you.